Ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin by reminding you of something that you all know already. Incidentally, as you can see, I no longer look like that, but uh, I looked like that when I came here last time. Uh, I want to begin by telling you something you, you al already know, and that is that on the 28th of June 1914, when um, the Archduke, um, Franz Ferdinand, the successor to the Austrian throne, and his wife, Sophie Kotek, came to Sarajevo, to the, the, the railway station at Sarajevo, war, Europe was still at peace. And in fact, if you had asked most of the best informed statesmen of that period, uh, did they believe a European war was likely, um, almost all of them would have told you that in recent months, in the last 12 or 18 months, a war had become less rather than more probable. A European war was becoming less likely. And yet, as you all know, 37 days later, Europe was indeed at war, and this war has justifiably, in my view, been described as the Urkatastrophe, the Mutterkatastrophe, I think is um, an expression which has been used, will be used by a speaker later this afternoon, um, the original catastrophe of the 20th century. It consumed three empires, or four, if you count the Ottoman Empire as well, the Russian, the German, the Ottoman, and of course the Austro-Hungarian. And more importantly, it consumed the lives of at least 10 million young men on its numerous uh, fields of conflict. Uh, it caused between 15 and 21 million wounded. And I'm not talking here about light wounds which were treated in theater. We don't have good global statistics, but the estimates range between 15 and 21 serious wounds, um, many of which had a lasting effect on people's lives thereafter. And the visual memory of this war is very much marked by the presence of mutilated veterans, of men who looked uh, transformed as a consequence of their encounter with this extraordinary period of violence. And so I think um, Fritz Stern, the, the German emigre um, US historian, is right when he says that this is the disaster from which all the other disasters of the 20th century sprang. It's very difficult to imagine the rise of fascism in Italy Without this war, it's difficult to imagine the October Revolution in what became the Soviet Union. It's very easy to imagine something like the February Revolution. Everybody had predicted a liberal takeover of some kind, a constitutionalization of czarism. Everyone had predicted that, but what nobody had predicted was the Sovietization by a small minority party, the Bolsheviks, of that country, um, an event which in my view was unthinkable without the First World War, and of course, it's very difficult to imagine the rise of national socialism, of Nazism, and therefore also of the Holocaust um, without this war. So I, I, I think that um, it, it's right to think of the First World War as a, as a catastrophe, uh, as a, a sort of originary catastrophe for the 20th century, the disaster that deformed this century before it was 20 years old. And my, my colleague, former colleague in Cambridge and now at Yale University, Adam Toos, is currently writing a book which will come out, I think, next year. Um, in which he reflects on the, on the war and specifically on the crisis of 1917 and argues that this war uh, unhinged, that's the metaphor he uses, it unhinged the entire world system in ways that were extremely toxic and extremely dangerous and had very lasting consequences. And so it follows from these um, rather gloomy reflections that the question of how this war came about possesses a certain intrinsic interest. Now, I don't want to disappoint you, but I'm not the first person to have noticed that this is an interesting question. This is an old debate. In fact, it's older than the war itself, because the argument about who, who was bringing this war about, who was responsible for the outbreak of this war, began before the first shots were fired. And it's astonishing how many of the, the lines of argument we find in the literature, you can also find in the mouths of those who actually brought this war about as they all pointed their fingers at uh, the other side and said, they are bringing war to us, they are forcing us into war. So this argument is even older than the war itself, and the American historian John W. Langdon did a count in 1991, a very interesting book called The Long Debate, which tells you everything you need to know, really, of the title. Um, in 1991, he counted 25,000 books and articles that one would really have to read in order to be abreast of this literature, and that's in English alone. So one could spend an entire life, at least an entire life, simply acquainting oneself with the English language literature. 
And um, I'm reminded of the, the novelist, Rebecca West, wonderful novelist, who wrote um, a superb and very deep <coughs> reflection on the place of the Balkans, of Yugoslavia, in 20th century European history in 1937. She went to Sarajevo to look at the places where um, the war began, and she went to the balcony on the Sarajevo City Hall, the balcony from which the, um, the, the successor to the throne, uh, Franz Ferdinand, had taken a last look over this very beautiful city before getting back into his car and driving to his appointment with the assassination. Um, and she comments, she, she remarks in this book, she recalls saying to her husband, or more precisely to one of her husbands, she had several, um, <laughs> saying to her husband, Paul, um, I shall never understand how it all happened. This is what she says, and she adds, it's not that we don't know enough, it's that we know too much. This was in 1937, and of course we know a great deal more now. And so then the question arises, why go to all the trouble, because it is a lot of trouble, to write yet another book about this <laughs> war? And of course, this question was posed to me many times by colleagues. Um, I remember one colleague coming up to me and saying, you're not writing a book about the outbreak of the First World War. I mean, hasn't that been done to death? I mean, is there anything new to say? This is a wonderful feature of colleagues, that just as one is struggling with a really difficult problem, <laughs> they come to one with excellent reasons why one should just give up and die. <laughs> of course, there has to be an answer to this question, and there is an answer in my view. Um, and my answer is that the debate may be old, but the question is still fresh. Uh, indeed, in some respects, the question is fresher now than it was in the 1970s and 80s, or when I first encountered it as a schoolboy in Sydney, Australia. When I first learned about this drama of 1914, the whole story had acquired what one could call a kind of period drama. It was, uh, it was a bit like one of those television programs where everybody's wearing beautiful uniforms and costumes. Um, you think of the books by Barbara Tuckman, The Proud Tower and, uh, Night and The Guns of August, wonderful pieces of narrative history, um, which were very widely read in Britain and the United States and still widely read today. Um, in these books, Tuckman dwells almost lovingly, I think it's not an exaggeration to say this, on uniforms, on, on Lord Salisbury riding to the House of Commons on a tricycle, pushed by his butler James, um, well, going uphill, he has to be pushed, then he says, let go, let go, and he would roll down the other side of the hill with his coat tails fluttering, fluttering like that. Um, a great deal of detail on the menus, the elaborate menus, the court dinners, on the extraordinarily um, complex etiquette of the Habsburg court, which um, stipulated even where royal babies should be positioned uh, in court, at court occasions. And reading books like this, and reading accounts like that of Europe's last summer, as, as it was called by David Frumkin, the, the assertion stealthily established itself that if these people had beautiful green ostrich feathers on their helmets and on their hats, then perhaps they had beautiful green ostrich feathers on their dreams, their thoughts, uh, as well. In other words, that these might be people of yesterday, people of a vanished world who have nothing to tell us, people we no longer understand. On the other hand, if, from the perspective of the early 20th century, where we are standing, one looks again with fresh eyes on the events of 1914, then one cannot help but be struck by the raw modernity of this event. The fact, first of all, that it begins with a cavalcade of automobiles. <coughs> This is not prancing horses and carriages, uh, like the Queen's, uh, the changing of the guard today in London. This is a line of cars. Reading uh, the description of the events of, of the 28th of June, one is reminded of Dallas in 1963. Uh, it begins with a squad of suicide bombers. And I use the term suicide bomber advisedly. These, the young men who went to Sarajevo to, to assassinate the, uh, the Archduke were carrying not just bombs and, and pistols, but also um, potassium cyanide. I found them completely uh, exotic figures. I couldn't make any sense of them at all. Uh, but today, the suicide bomber, for obvious reasons, is, is a more familiar figure. And our, our compass has shifted in other ways as well. If you think, for example, of how the Yugoslav wars of the 1990s have changed our awareness of the place of the Balkans in this story. It is an extraordinary feature of the literature on the First World War that, in much of it, the Balkans are airbrushed out. They're simply a blind spot in the literature, which is entirely about the geopolitical maneuverings between the two alliance blocs. Um, that, it seems to me, is a distortion. And the 1990s reminded us that Balkan nationalism is an historical force, which 
can change things, can have a transformative um, impact. And that does not mean, um, and this is, it's very important, not that I, you know, I don't want to be misunderstood in this sense, that does not mean pointing the finger of blame at one or another Balkan state. It does not mean saying, ah, the Serbs are to blame. It just means putting the various forms of turbulence and instability on the Balkan Peninsula back into the larger picture uh, as part of a larger European perspective. Then there's the fact that the attack on the Twin Towers in New York reminded us, I think, of the power of a single event, a single event freighted with symbolic <coughs> meaning. The power of a single event, even if we see it as deeply anchored in longer-term transitions and processes, the power of an event, a terrorist event in particular, to transform politics, to change the chemistry of politics. I think we're more sensitized now to the power of an event than we were, and perhaps more able to appreciate the transformative impact of those two twin assassi assassinations of Franz Ferdinand and his wife uh, on at least the Austrian political elite. There's no question that there was a, a very deep impact, and it's important to emphasize that because in many accounts of the First World War, these murders are written off as, a, as an irrelevance, as a sort of red herring. That is a complete misreading of how the Austrian leadership responded to those assassinations. Finally, it seems to me we're just only really just beginning come, to come to terms with um, the fact that we're, we've, we've exited the period of bipolar, what's sometimes been called bipolar stability, a period when world affairs were disciplined by the encounter, by the rivalry between two nuclear hyperpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Well, that era is now over, and in its place we have a multipolar world, um, a much less predictable world, a world with declining powers, um, if you think of the, the former Soviet Union, or even of the United States, which is now asking itself very difficult questions of, about how much longer it continue, can continue to sustain what it calls the full spectrum dominance that it aspired to after 1945. Um, so we have rising powers, declining empires. Uh, China, of course, is a very important figure now, a very important player on the international stage. Uh, there are regional crisis zones, um, the, which seem to remain critical, the Middle East, Northern Africa, the South China Sea, and so on. And in all these ways, the world we are now in seems to be getting more like 1914. 1914 is getting closer to us, even as it paradoxically draws away from us in time, even as we reach the 100th anniversary. In some ways, it seems to me, um, it speaks to us more freshly, more immediately than it did um, 30 or 40 years ago. And these shifts in perspective, these shifts in our vantage point, prompt us to rethink the story of how war came about in 1914. And accepting this challenge does not mean, it emphatically does not mean, embracing a vulgar presentism, which wants to remake the past in order to meet the political um, needs of the present. Rather, it means acknowledging those features of the past which, of which our changed vantage point affords us a clearer view. It seems to me that when we look at the past, we do so with each passing year from a different vantage point because our present is changing. And there's, there's no point in trying to deny that. There's, there's no way we historians or anybody else can escape from the pressures of the present. Um, but we should acknowledge that and recognize that there's something positive in this, that as we move, for example, in front of a building, just as we see parts of the facade we couldn't see from a different position, so as we, our, our vantage point changes in the present with the, with the, with the change, changing present, so uh, we become able to see aspects of the past that had until now have been hidden from view. Bearing all of this in mind, the question then arises, how does one refresh the narrative? How does one develop a distinctive approach to a question like this one? And it seems to me that in my efforts to do so fell into four categories. We, and this is a very short uh, talk, so I've only got about another um, 12 minutes, so I'm going to keep it very brief. But I just want to make a couple of brief points. And the first is, I try to change the story by changing the question. In other words, instead of asking, why did this war break up? Uh, which is the question at the heart of, the, of much of the origins literature. Why did this war come about? Instead, I opted to ask the question, how did it come about? And of course, questions of how and why are not logically separable. They're always um, cognate. They're interwoven at their roots. But nevertheless, they lead us in different questions, in different directions. The question, why did this war happen, leads us in the direction of categorical, cat or categorical <coughs> causes, categorical abstractions, because of nationalism, 
because of imperialism, because of arms races, um, that kind of thing. And what happens is that a sort of once you start piling up these categories, uh, and a lot of books do this chapter by chapter: nationalism, arms races, imperialism, and so on. Um, once you start piling up these causes, um, you get an optical illusion. The optical illusion is that the causal pressure for a war is steadily growing. Eventually, a war has to happen because these causes are multiplying. And as a consequence, the agency, the power to the, the maneuver, the space, the maneuver, the maneuver space, the freedom of movement of those men, because they, they were, it has to be said, all men, uh, who had the power to decide for or against war, to make decisions which would or would not make war more likely, their agency and their freedom to act is pushed, squeezed out of the scene. And instead, all we see is these individuals acting as executors of abstract, impersonal historical forces. And yet they were anything but that, because this war was the consequence of decisions, consciously made decisions, which brought it about. And some of the most interesting recent writing on the war, one thinks of Holger Aflerbach's book, um, The Improbable War, which argues, I mean, it's a compiled volume, but Aflerbach wrote a, Aflerbach and David Stevenson wrote a wonderful introductory essay, and they make the point that actually, paradoxically, in some ways, this war gets less probable before it becomes more probable. I mean, at some point, it's obviously very, very, very probable because it actually happens. But before it happened, it was becoming less probable. It sounds, sounds paradoxical, but that is, in fact, they make a very good case for that view. So that was one thing, to try and put the agency, the decision-making, back into uh, the story. There's another reason for um, being wary of the why approach, and that is, and I think it was put very well by a Bulgarian historian of the, um, of the Balkan Wars, um, and of the First World War, who commented that when we ask the question why, <coughs> guilt soon becomes the focal point. In other words, when we ask the question why, what we often mean is who? Who did this terrible thing to Europe? Um, and what we then do is we look around for a suspect. The most, fa the most uh, favored suspect um, has been, I mean, statistically speaking, Germany. Um, but some studies have blamed Russia. There's even my um, naughty colleague, Neil Ferguson, who's blamed Britain. Um, and there have been, I mean, there have been, basically, almost every state has been accused of bringing this war about uh, individually. But basically, it's the, the approach I'm talking about. What you do is you identify a suspect, then you start gathering, you know, what the Germans call the Weissmaterial. You produce a charge sheet. You find all this evidence of nasty things that were said by one minister to another. They sound aggressive and unpleasant. Um, and then you put that all together and you have a crushing case for the guilt of this particular um, state. And I wanted to get away from that. I wanted um, to ask the question how, which it seems to me proposes a rather different um, a line of approach, namely a journey through the events, a journey through the decisions which brought the war about that aims to identify those decisions that made it happen. Um, and that does not mean focusing on one state alone, but thinking about all the decisions that made this war more likely, all the decisions that put structures in place, pieces of causality in place, that made it possible in 1914 for an assassination in the city of Sarajevo to produce a continental conflagration. Okay, so that was the first point, really, too, and the one I wanted to say most about, namely the, the, the idea of changing the question from why to how. Um, of course, in the end, you can't dodge the question of responsibility. You have to come back to it. But the aim was to let the why questions grow out of the answers to the how questions, rather than the other way around. Rather than decide, first of all, well, we know who did this, now let's work out how they did it, um, which has often been the approach in the origins literature. There's something else one can do, and it seems to me this is just, just involves following the trends in historical writing in general over the last 10 or 15 years, and that is one can globalize the field of vision. This is a European story, and one of the most important um, things to do, and this was mentioned earlier on by one of the earlier speakers, I thought that was a very interesting point, that we have to, it's not a question of Europe, Europeanizing the story, but just recognize that this is a European event, <coughs> and the war was brought about through European processes, it was a European catastrophe. But of course we can go further than that, we can globalize the field of vision and recognize that in many ways, the politics of the European alliances, the emergence of the European alliances, makes no sense without the rising importance, for example, of China. The China question in the 1890s is terribly important, for the, both for the deepening um, you know, um, rivalry and suspicion between Britain and Russia, which is a very important feature in pre-war world affairs, but also for the growing British 
um, suspicion of Germany, especially after the suppression of the Boxer Rebellion and the seizure of, of, um, of Chinese bridgeheads by the Kaiser in the 1890s. Um, so one can globalize the field of vision, one can put Central Asia back into the story, the, the, the very complex relationship between Russia and Britain in Central Asia, especially in Persia, Britain's concern about Russian incursions into areas close to northern India, the, the crown and the British Empire. These are very important because, as Arthur Nicholson put it, a very senior functionary in the British Foreign Office, he said, we have to, um, we have to find a way of tethering the Russians. We have, to, we have to tie them to our bosom. We have to tie them to our breast. Um, and indeed, he says in 1914, it may be that we have to fight the Germans in order not to have to fight the Russians. So relations between Britain and Russia are very important for, um, for the background to this war. We have to globalize the scene as well and not, not see this as a sort of parochial European story where um, a bunch of European powers provoke each other, get irritated by, uh, with each other, like a family Christmas that's gone horribly wrong. We have to recognize that this is a global, a global story. A further point, one can develop a new pattern of emphasis. A whole bunch of really comfortable, familiar narratives have, had settled over this subject of 1914, and one can try by changing the emphasis a little to, to push at this and that part of that narrative. One way in which one can do that is to, instead of thinking about these states as having a foreign policy, Germany wants this, Russia has a Balkan policy, wants to do this, and so on, one can recognize, as indeed was the case, that these states had highly chaotic decision-making processes, that these executives were not, did not um, make themselves heard in a single voice which, um, which pursued a single line, but rather that we can speak of a choir of dissident voices all demanding to be heard, especially in Russia, for example. If you had asked in 19, let's say in the, the summer of 1904, if you were to ask a very well-informed observer of the Russian political scene, who makes foreign policy, the answer would without doubt be the Tsar. The Tsar himself is making policy, is pressing the Japanese very hard, and this is a very good thing, we're going to get into Korea, we're going to get deeper into Manchuria, and so on. This is all that Tsar is doing. Then it comes to the appalling disaster of the Russo-Japanese War. You ask the same question again in 1907, that Tsar has disappeared from the scene, now it's Stalipin. The, the chairman of the Council of Ministers, the Russia's prime minister, so to speak, an extremely powerful figure. But if you ask the question a year later, during the Bosnian annexation crisis, the answer would be the foreign minister, Izvolsky. He's now broken with Zulipin. He's formed, made a deal with the Tsar behind the backs of the other ministers. I don't want to go into any more detail on this. The point is that power was constantly slipping from one part of each of these executive structures to another. Paris is even more chaotic. I mean, think of the fact that during the tenure in office, of Edward Grey, the foreign secretary in Britain, 16 French foreign ministers came and went. Two of them came and went twice. Now that's really something. They entered office, they left. A year or two later, they came back in, they left again. Um, and several of these foreign ministers were in office for a few months only. So one can speak of anything but a consistent political line. In fact, sometimes it seems to me the word, the English word policy is not a very helpful word. Um, because there is such a lack of <laughs> unitary decision-making. Further, one can emphasize features of the story, like the Balkan background. I don't want to go into the detail, but that's one very important thing. The Libyan War of 1911, it, Italy's unprovoked attack on Libya, was a crucial factor in destabilizing the Balkans. The, the, the Serbian chief of the political department of the foreign ministry in Belgrade, after the war, gave a, an interview to a French journalist in Paris, and he said, it was the war in Libya, the Italian war in Libya. C'était la première agression. He said that was the first aggression from which all the other um, instability followed. And he knew whereof he spoke. This was the head of the political department of the Serbian <coughs> foreign ministry. And finally, of course, one can search uh, <coughs> for and try and find new sources. And of course, one's never going to find a smoking gun. This has been the most plowed over issue in, in the history of histor histor historical writing, I think. Um, but there, there were, nevertheless, there are sources which have been underexploited. The Belgian envoy reports are <coughs> extremely valuable because Belgium was, of course, as you know, a neutral state. Um, it was mildly pro-German, an ironic and somewhat tragic fact, given it's, uh, what happened after the outbreak of the First World War. But um, the Belgian envoys reported with very clear eyes, in particular in St. Petersburg and in Paris, and you can use those reports to get a, a, a viewpoint on 
French and Russian policy, which is at variance with the traditional canonical account, at least the account that passes for canonical in Britain. And there are many other ways in which one can um, you know, develop new sources. There are wonderful private papers from various um, junior diplomats in French service. The staffer, Comte de Robien, a junior member of staff at the St. Petersburg Embassy, wrote a magnificent private diary in which he reflects, he observes and reflects on um, Prime, uh, President Poincaré's um, diplomacy in St. Petersburg during the summer of 1914, and so on. So there's a lot one can do to try and make this story fresh again. And once you've done this, it's very hard, uh, once again, to walk um, the path of the Fisher thesis, of the thesis which Fritz Fisher developed in the 1960s and 70s, perhaps the most influential single intervention in this historiography, in, in its history since 1914, um, the thesis which argued that the Germans not only caused this war, they actually planned it in advance. They brought it about, they willed it, they, they caused it. Um, this war was, as it were, inflicted on Europe by one of its states, by Germany. Um, it's very hard to, re to return to the simplicities of the Fischer thesis once one has looked at these decisions that brought war about because they aren't all German decisions. They are, there are very important German contributions. The Germans are just as aggressive, just as imperialist, just as paranoid as everybody else. But there are other decisions as well that have to be figured in, have to be calculated in, to uh, in order to explain how this war came about. There's no doubt that what we call in Britain the blame game, the game of, 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 of assigning blame to this, that, or the other party, has a tremendous moral appeal. Imposing blame or assigning blame gives a sort of shock of pleasure to the person, not to the person who's receiving the blame, obviously, but to the person who's handing the blame out. There's, there's, no, there's no, I mean, for one thing, I think it would be marvelous to be a judge where you can point at the criminal and say, you are guilty of a very terrible crime. It must be very enjoyable saying that. Um, the appeal of that actually is never um, diminished. Uh, and the problem with the blame game, it seems to me, is not that one might end up blaming the wrong party, because frankly, it, now long, it no longer matters who is to blame for this war, not in political terms. It doesn't really matter. The problem with the blaming approach, the, the should, the approach which is oriented towards um, should or uh, unfortunate responsibility, blame, culpability, the problem with this approach is rather a different one, namely that if you moralize the mode of inquiry in this way, then you have to assume, you wind up assuming that in all conflicts between opposed interests, one party is in the right and the other party is in the wrong. And yet, this is clearly a, an infantile way of thinking about international relations. Was it wrong for the Serbs to seek to unify serfdom? I mean, this is an almost universal um, aspiration by the Soviet political elite. Was that wrong? Well, no, of course it wasn't. It was no more wrong than it was for Italians to wish to unify an Italian nation state and to bring areas currently under Austrian control into Italy. Was that wrong? It, it would be ridiculous to say that that was wrong. It was an historical fact. It was something that was happening. Was it wrong for the Austrians to insist on an independent Albania in, 18, in 1913. Well, absurdly, I mean, it would be absurd to say that was wrong. Obviously, the Albanian policy of Austria and the Serbian policy of the unification of all Serbs were irreconcilable policies. They could not both be realized without bringing about conflict. So the point is to recognize that these conflicts of interest, when pursued if, in, in, a, in a violent way, could produce real conflict, armed conflict. And to get away from this notion that we're dealing with goodies and baddies, with a kind of what I call the psychopath path and the park thesis. You have a, a sunny suburban park where everybody's, you know, the Balkan states are sitting in, in their swings, giggling and laughing with each other. Italy and France are playing chess with those big stone chess pieces. Italy, um, Russia is falling asleep below a tree and so on. And suddenly in comes the German psychopath with a samurai sword and so on. <laughs> that sort of story, I'm afraid, will no longer carry water. Because this story of 1914 was not a James Bond movie. Uh, there are no velvet-jacketed villains um, in mountain hideaways stroking their cats with prosthetic